Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name's Jason Carty. My name's Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. When the Beatles last recorded together in August 1969, it was a dream that they would make one more record together. Imagine a parallel universe where, a little over two and a half years later, John, Paul, George and Ringo got back together one more time on vinyl. Well, it did happen. It just wasn't a Beatles record. It was Ringo's album, Ringo, which came out at the end of 1973. And that's the record that we're going to focus in and look at today. How did it come to pass? And how does it stand up all these years later? Listen, broadly speaking, Stephen, I'm a fan of this record. It's 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 a gem. I'm a huge fan of this record. I, I I love this record. Yeah, it's 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 fantastic, and it 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 holds up. It it really encapsulates all the things that we uh, know and love about Ringo. Um, so let's have a look because it's an interesting. It, it comes at an interesting time. In some ways, it's it feels like a debut album for Ringo. It's not a debut album. He put out two albums in 1970. Yes, uh, which are uh, Sentimental Journey and Boku Blues. Yeah. Uh, so th- those are really, uh, if you like, I suppose, vanity pro- projects. Um, yeah. uh, you know, we're used these days to rock stars putting out their album standards or their, you know, hip hop album or their Irish folk music album. But this, mm. this, this was Ringo uh, had, had put these two albums out. He really, I don't think, counts them as part of his canon or part of his catalog um you know i think he very much regards ringo as being uh his debut album and certainly that's the way uh to to approach it i think he 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 has two excellent singles um then he sort of puts the recording uh career to one side focuses on film and then uh find takes his time uh getting getting around to recording this you know it's i don't know how thought out it was but he was clearly not wanting to rush uh, in, into competition with the other three, and it's interesting because you know it's it's a lifetime in, in in at that time the three years he spends you know two albums in nineteen seventy and then the three year gap until Ringo comes out yeah. and in that time you know John's putting out Imagine and George is putting out All Things Must Pass and Paul is putting out loads of records and eventually getting to <laughs> eventually reaching that band in the run place and you know you know I, people probably weren't waiting for the big Ringo solo statement. And it, it it wasn't like he wasn't busy. He was quite busy in 71, 72, 73. He was. His focus was was simply not recording an album. Um, yeah. he, he was working on films. So there's a list of films, Blind Man, That'll Be The Day, 200 Motels, which is the Frank Zappa film, um, Son of Dracula, which we'll maybe touch on at some point in the future. Um, yep, the films of Ringo um, Starr. Films of Ringo Starr, Born to Boogie. So he was hanging out with Mark Boland. He was making a documentary. Um, he also had a furniture business, uh, Ringo or Robin. Ah. Um, where th- th- this, from, from from what I can know about this, it seems largely to be engraving the Apple logo on bits of furniture and selling it for vastly inflated sums. But uh, Are you going to tell me that some of this furniture goes for insane amounts of money these days? Do we have any documentary evidence of Ringo or Robin furniture that, Seems like the kind of thing that would pop up in some sort of vanity auction these days. Yeah, well, well welcome to my living room. <laughs> oh, uh, I see. <laughs> no, no, it, it's it's it's. Uh, I, I've seen descriptions of things which are sort of photographs of uh, sort of polished chrome ashtrays, and uh, yeah. they they famously made an etched mirror for Harry Nilsson for Harry Nilsson's bathroom. Oh. Um, except what they did was they etched a noose. Uh, on the mirror so that when he was shaving his head appeared to be in a noose um even harry nilsson drew the line at that and had it had it had it removed but so he's 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 throwing himself into other projects other than uh mainstream rock projects. yes and and something that's kind of happening in the background that's worth keeping in mind because it, it kind of infuses itself into the ringo album is this maybe you might call it a rock and roll revivalism or people are starting to kind of, you know, uh, put things to, you know, they look back to what was happening in the mid fifties. These guys were all in their thirties and they felt they were over the hill, you know? 
Exactly. I mean, this is this is this is this first wave of nostalgia for that first uh, um, flush of of rock and roll. So you, you I, I suppose the group that I always think of is Shana Na and oh, their, their weird <laughs> weird rock and roll re- revival routine um, <laughs> in 1969 at Woodstock, and then of course Lennon appears at the Toronto uh, Rock and Roll Festival. Um, yeah. So again, in 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 the early seventies, you know, I'm I'm old enough to remember Bill Haley having a uh, a hit a single, moment. Uh, a moment. Uh, Chuck Berry was back in the charts. So, uh, yeah, there was a sort of nostalgia for that first flush of uh, of rock and roll, and and certainly, you know, you had American Graffiti, uh, you had Happy Days coming along. That that early to mid seventies period was very nostalgic. Yeah, Shannon, ah, man, that just sent shivers down the spine. I, I went, you know, YouTube. I went down a Shannon ah, rabbit hole one day on YouTube because they they're regularly mocked on the Comedy Bang Bang podcast and. Uh, uh, it's re- they're really unfathomable. <laughs> Shana, no. Yeah, I think if, if 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 anybody out there hasn't seen them, their gold lame suited appearance at Woodstock is something to behold. Yes, they make they make the UK's darts seem like I don't know, Little Richard. It's quite a, yeah. it's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Anyway, um, let's get back to the topic on hand because the Ringo album is is an album from 1973, and the bulk of it's recorded uh, March and April 73, and it comes out at the end of 73. Um, and and you know it's coming out in the context of we have had uh, some Ringo singles before that, haven't we? We've had which ones have we had? Yes, uh, so you have uh, it. Don't come easy. Yeah, uh, and uh, back off, Boogaloo. Off Boogaloo. Um, the interesting thing to me is though both of those songs are essentially co-writes. Uh, with between Ringo and George, yeah. Um, so although George doesn't get a, an official credit um, on it, don't come easy. I think yeah. everyone um, uh, is is pretty clear that George is uh, uh, one of the prime movers there. He's he's he deserves a writing credit. Yes, yeah. And um, so it, it's kind of sending a template for Ringo getting helped by a fellow Fab. Yes, and this is really sets the tone for that the the Ringo album itself and there's another Harrison collaboration there which provides another single and it's really tempting uh to to speculate what that writing partnership might have been like if they had persisted you know they 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 between between them um you know they have four or five six uh top 10 uh, US UK singles during this period um three number one singles uh mm-hmm. i think um uh, uh, coming out of that partnership, uh, all the way back to Octopus's Garden is effectively a co-write. So, you know, it's that collaboration with George. I think uh, is very important. And um, yeah, that George Ringo thing. It's an inter- it is an interesting access that you know George brings melody to into Ringo's world quite quite heavily. And you could argue that uh, you know Ringo brings a certain kind of levity or you know a, a change of tone to George's lyrical bent. You know. Yes, I mean, even I would admit George can be slightly serious, uh, and I think they, I think, I, th- I think they, I think they work extremely well together. Yeah, and they were both in the together. Beatles, I believe, so that's a good thing. Too. Uh, yeah, so they, they, the common background, shared, <laughs> shared background. So when we try and look at, you know, when this project kind of starts, uh, you might be looking back to, you know, the start of March, and and on the third of March, nineteen seventy three, Harry Nielsen and Ringo are presenters at the the Grammy Awards in LA, isn't that right? That's right, and th- this this seems to have been something that was um, organised or or uh, set up by Richard Perry, who is a record producer. He's probably most famous before the Ringo album for producing Carly Simon's No Secrets album in 1972. But he had worked with Ringo back in 1970 as an arranger on Sentimental Journey. Yeah. Um, he puts forward this notion to the organisers of the Grammys. Hey, it would be great to get. Uh, uh, Ringo and Harry um, to present something. Harry Nilsson was nominated for a Grammy that year. Well, he was um, nominated for Nielsen Schmielsen, which is also a Richard yeah, Perry production. So he exactly had, he had done this thing for Nielsen where he had taken this kind of mercurial talent and yep. fashioned something very. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call Nielsen Schmielsen a sensible album, but it certainly got a, a saleable quality to it, and it it got it gets to the essence of of uh, of Nielsen. Yes, yes. And uh, it, it's that connection that really drives forward uh, is the initial impetus uh, for Ringo. Yeah. And reading around it, you do get the sense that Richard Perry, w- he knew what he was doing. You know, he was very purposefully setting this up 
um, and yeah. putting himself in the producer's chair. Um, now, I do remember seeing the clip of Ringo and Harry Nilsson at the Grammys. It's no longer on YouTube, but these yeah. things go up and come down. Yes. But it's very funny. Uh, they come on, they do that sort of monkeys cross walk that the monkeys do down the beach at the start of their TV show and they do a sort of two-handed skit, uh, clearly enjoying each other's company. And, 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 <laughs> and each other's uh, drinks cabinet, uh, probably. Yes, each other's drinks cabinet. <laughs> they are clearly refreshed, yes. Um, so, and Richard Perry, somebody else who was in Richard Perry's orbit was Klaus Vorman, who plays the, the bass on Carly Simon's You're So Vain, the very famous kind of yes. wobbly bass at the start. Yeah. And it's, he, he, he's going to play a big role in what's about to happen. So Two days later, then, um, Ringo's in the studio with Harry Nielsen, being produced by Richard Perry, and they're laying down the first track of the album, which is You're 16. Now, yeah. was this, uh, this wasn't totally off the back of the Grammys. This was obviously, the, go, this, this was kind of on the cards anyway. This was this seems to have been on the cards. Richard Perry had sort of block booked uh, a, a period of time at Sunset. Yeah, uh, recorder, sound recorders in LA, and um, you know, so I, I, you get the sense that R Ringo's initial idea for this album was it was going to be a world album in in the sense that he wanted like, to like record, Peter Gabriel, no, uh, <laughs> not 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 quite, um, but he 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 wanted to um, record a track in London, record a track in New York, record a track in right. LA, you know, go off to. I, I don't know, Delhi or South Africa or where, probably not South Africa uh, or <laughs> wherever. Um, but uh, so I, th uh, you know, I don't know how, if that was still on the cards at this stage, but clearly Richard Perry takes, takes a punt, yeah. block books, books the five days. Let's see what happens. Um, and I think the initial recording with Harry Nilsson uh, on your 16 goes so well yes. that that really sets uh, sets things up and sets the tone uh, for for what to follow. And it's you know you, you listen to that track, You're sixteen, which is the last track on side A of the album, and you know you, you, you hear that it's Nielsen who is doing his Nielsen thing. That's what, what yes. what's really yeah. making making that sound so sweet. Like you listen to those backing vocals, and he's har harmonizing with himself, which is one of Nielsen's great gifts. Um, which was harmony and kind of close recording. There's a great uh, clip of Nielsen on BBC TV special where he's singing with himself, yes, uh, which yes. you, you might have seen through the through the technology of the early 70s. But those vocal arrangements are spectacular. It is. I mean, you know, the entire structure, the entire vocal structure there, it's almost more of a, a, a Nielsen track yeah. in the sense of the arrangement and the vocal uh, uh, Sort of the bed of the entire song is put together by by Harry Nilsson, and then you also the, have yeah the cream of so session people are there as well. I, I was going to say you also yeah. have the very sort of distinctive uh, piano from from Nicky Hopkins. Uh, you've got Bobby Keys who played with the Stones doing a sax uh, solo. So uh, you know Klaus Vorman is there. So it's I, I'm one of the things that you get with you, you have a same rotating cast of characters um, yeah. across Stones albums. You know Harrison albums, Ringo's albums, Nilsson's albums. It's the same gang is yeah. kind of hang, hanging out and playing across all of these early seventies uh, albums. Yeah, and it's it's uh, as you say, uh, Nicky Hopkins and Klaus Foreman are there. Uh, Nicky Hopkins had played on a Beatles track. He played on the Revolution B side to to Hey Jude. Yep. That's his piano piece, and he's he's all over many Stones records. Um, and it's 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 also maybe unbeknownst to Ringo. Uh, again, this recurring theme of old rock and roll. And, you know, the song comes out as the second single in 74 and, and gets to number one for a week. But there's a lot of other things happening in the, there's like uh, the movie American Graffiti, isn't there? Because it's, it's that that's kind of happening at the end of 73. Yes. And the original version of this song was recorded by Johnny Burnett in 1960. And it featured heavily in American Graffiti. Yeah. I, I, I don't think Ringo or Richard Perry could possibly have known that that, that was coming when they were recording. Um, you know, they're recording at the start of the year. American Graffiti comes out in August, but yeah. it was just a, a, a fantastic coincidence that uh, that it that undoubtedly helped propel Ringo's version to the and if uh, and something that may or may not still be on YouTube is a, a a TV special from 1978 where he sings this song in a rather cheesy, terrible way with Carrie Fisher as the uh, yes the young love interest. Um, that uh, that has to be seen to be believed. It's um, very, it's you know, hilarious and slightly <laughs> dis slightly disturbing uh, uh, version of that song. Uh, it, it's clear. Uh, I think it's clear. Carrie Fisher has no idea who Ringo Starr is, or why <laughs> why she is there, or possibly where she is. That is um, that is possible by that uh, state yeah. state 
state of uh, stage of time. Um, so that's great. And then, you know, what we might do now is look at the, the next song that's recorded. Uh, and then from then on in, we'll probably look at the songs in order that they appear on the album, because the next song that is recorded is the opening track of the record, uh, which is I'm the Greatest, yeah. written by... Uh, John Lennon. John Lennon of the Beatles again. Yeah, and Again, we'll... the coincidence is amazing. <laughs> what are the chances? Um, and so... It seems that, you know, by the that kind of second week in March or in the 10th of March, Lennon and Harrison are in Los Angeles. They've got business to attend to. Um, they know that Ringo has started recording with Harry Nielsen. So they decide to yep. just appear, more or less. It's reasonably yes. casual. I, 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 that certainly all the stories are that this is a reasonably uh, casual um, meeting. George drops in initially, uh, listens to what Ringo's got recorded for the first couple of days says this is absolutely fantastic then then john turns up with with yoko um one of the reasons he was in uh la was also to promote yoko's approximately infinite universe great album um album so yoko uh is is there uh sadly doesn't make an appearance on on ringo but still she is on the cover uh if you uh scan the crowd um so yeah john arrives he's got a song i'm the greatest um, which has a bit of a history. He'd, he'd written it back in 1971, uh, presumably for as a song that he was going to record himself. Um, but he donates it to this this project. And I think, certainly bearing in mind the title and the lyrics, it's probably best that he gave it to Ringo. Yes, it's it's interesting because you know the so the song kind of opens the album, and it, it kind of immediately plunges us into this you know nostalgia theme. You know, and it kind of plunges us into this kind of branding of Ringo as you yeah. know, what he is doing as he's entertaining you know he's uh, he's referring back to the Beatles I was part of the greatest show on earth he's talking about Billy Shears um you know he's saying catastrophically that he's 32 <laughs> yeah. and all he wants to do is boogaloo yeah. and you know if you're listening John and George are on it you hear John singing along with them and there is a mix from these sessions in the Lennon anthology box set from the late yes. 90s where you can hear John Lennon's take on on the song as well um and and then playing bass is Klaus Vormann so all of a sudden you have this song and this song has John George and Ringo and their new bass player Klaus um and it's it's the closest thing we have so far to a reunion now this was rumored to be some kind of replacement band but that's a bit of a myth isn't it it is it is this 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 supposedly this was a group called the ladders yeah uh, and this is a this is a myth that still persists today and you can find lots of sort of if you go on the internet you can find made up set lists and track lists and things but th- this goes back to an interview that Ringo gave in 1972 Melody Maker where they're being at, he's being asked you know will they record together and he says uh, I'll be in a group with John and George and Klaus and we'll call it the ladders or whatever you want to call it but I don't think it would be called the Beatles so it's a, it's a throwaway remark you know yeah. he could have used any name but suddenly uh, th- this becomes a a a, a rumor um that the ladders was going to be an actual group. I mean, certainly one of the things that comes out of this session is that George gets the notion that this would be a great group, right. um, and and that he and John and and uh, Ringo should form a band. And uh, uh, J- John is very dismissive of this at the time, but particularly in 1980, in those sort of late 1980 interviews, uh, he says, you know, this was really embarrassing, and George was sort of pestering me and kept asking and you know it was a good session but you know how could he ever think i would i would form a band now bear in mind in late 1980 john didn't have a particularly good relationship with george yeah. but um but certainly there seems to have been a sense that something might have been possible and certainly george was the one that seemed to be uh the, the prime mover there well there's a there's a quote here from richard perry where he says um just like that, no planning. The three ex Beatles recorded one of John's songs. Everyone in the room was just gleaming. It's such a universal gleam with the Beatles. So obviously, there's a frisson of excitement about yeah. the fact that these three are playing, and the, the kind of the the rumor gets out. It's reported that the three of them are recording on this track. What I was trying to figure out, and maybe you don't know this off the top of your head, is this the last time John and George record together? Uh, I think so. I mean, George and John would not meet again. Yeah. Until December 1974. Right. Uh, um, which was the sort of dark end of the Dark Horse tour, the dissolution papers that was, and again they didn't they didn't have a particularly good time yeah. uh uh there. And uh 
you know, there are some meetings around 1974, but but I think this is the last time the two of them recorded together. Yeah, so it's interesting that, you know, there's all this talk that it's going to be the potential of a brand new mm. dawn. And actually, it's really the last time that you get John, uh, George and Ringo together in a room playing music, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's Lennon also said in a later interview that, you know, McCartney could have played on it, but he just wasn't in Los Angeles. He just wasn't around or he wasn't allowed into, I think, the US at that time. I think his, his drug arrests were still playing havoc with that. His, his one of many drug arrests was uh, were, were preventing him getting access. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's uh, that that's kind of a portentous opener. You know, Lennon goes back to New York after that. And, the you know, the first news appears uh, about a week later on the 17th of March that rumours it says in the Melody Maker, rumours flash through Los Angeles that three of the Beatles have teamed up for recording purposes. Um, so that's quite an exciting stamp to get things yeah. going. Yes, that the, the you know the headline for that article was Beatles to record again. So yeah. th- this was very much being put forward as uh, a a a full blown uh, reunion. And one one of the interesting things at this period is just how prevalent the Beatles were you know you, you know at this time it's around this time middle of March that they capital announced the red and blue albums are yeah. coming down the line they they get released at the beginning of uh, April you have Nicky Hopkins comes out denying that it's a Beatles reunion yeah uh, Klaus, Klaus Vorman makes a statement saying oh no it's just they were there and you know it wasn't planned it was just they they were looking for something to do so um so there's this this frantic downplaying yeah. by everyone involved that this is not uh, a reunion but it's seized upon particularly by by the melody maker um so let's move on to the next track on the album which is called have you seen my baby it's written by randy newman and yeah. randy newman i suppose in 73 he's getting into the process of becoming known as randy newman he's had this musician's existence and the songwriter's existence um for a decade at that point and he's he's forming his own solo identity and th- this track originally comes from randy newman's second album and he'd also uh, done an arrangement and a version for Fats Domino and yeah. also Randy Newman there's a, another Nielsen uh, overlap there because uh, Nielsen did his album of Randy Newman covers um, but the interesting thing about this track is Mark Bolan is on it yes uh, and there's so, no bigger star at that point really coming out in 1972 than Mark Bolan in the UK anyway it, it, in the UK I mean certainly uh, you know Bolan mania had had he he was regarded as you know it was comparable to Beatlemania. yeah um, Ringo was working with him as I said earlier on Born to Boogie which is a documentary film uh, he's Bolan is recording the album the slider yeah uh, at this particular time he's working with Tony Visconti he's sort of works with Bowie uh, goes on um t- so uh, he is huge at this i mean he's dominating the singles charts around this time so yeah. uh ringo was very much sort of aligning himself with the you know the up and coming yeah uh trend it's always been a, it's always been a very um yeah, it's always been an interesting relationship, the fact that Ringo and Mark Bolan were so close for such a, you know, um, specific period of time when when Bolan was really blowing up. And that Ringo, a lot of people might know this, Ringo took the, the, the famous cover photo on the front of the Slider album, the T-Rex album, the Slider, that kind of slightly blurry, iconic photo of Mark Bolan in his top hat, you know? Don't let Tony Visconti hear you say that. Why? He doesn't think that's true, no? He he claims that uh, that he took that photograph. Um, really, he said, uh, you know, Mark gave me his camera. I took the photographs, but whatever Mark thought, having Ringo giving him the credit would, you know, Look be a better, better thing. So he's, yeah, I think Tony's Tony's a bit put out about that. So, yeah. uh, well, the photos, we're, we're never, yeah, we're not we're, we're not going to get Tony on the show now. <laughs> and uh, and they were photos taken at Tippenhurst Park as well, that the, the rock and rollest yep. of all uh, mansions. So yeah, you listen to that song, and right at the start, you get a nice little, um, you know, a little boogie guitar riff from. Um, uh, from Mark Bolan, you know, uh, and, and yeah, the solo and the solo in the middle could be by no one else. Yeah, I mean, it's just even if even if you didn't know that that's who it was, you would know who that's who was playing. It's a very very distinctive guitar sound. And it's interesting because somebody else who was in that milieu at the time was Elton John. It's a wonder he's not on this Ringo album. He was probably too darn busy at the time, but he he had been playing with Ringo and Mark the previous year as well, hadn't he? That's right, and that turns up in the Born to Boogie documentary. Yeah. I, I watched I watched that film recently, and that, the absolute highlight is is a sort of rock and roll style jam yeah. with uh, uh, Ringo and Elton and Mark Bolan, and, and uh, you know 
there is a great appearance on top of the pops of T-Rex and in the band playing is, is Elton. Yes. From about yeah. That's a great clip as yeah. well. Um, okay. Track three on the album is not only the highlight of the album, the highlight of Ringo's solo career. It's just a general musical highlight. It's the song Photograph. Arguably, it, arguably the best solo single. From of, any Beatle. Beatle. <laughs> of any Beatle. Of any Beatle. Yeah. It's, it's just a beautiful song. It's uh, like all the best music. It, it, it sort of, uh, the way the light shines on it over the last 50 years, it changes its meaning, it changes its context. It's a it's a great track. Um, it's written by Ringo and George. And again, it's this dynamic of Ringo and George, you know, melodicism, melancholy, you know, maybe a little bit of Ringo. I hate to use the word simplicity, but, you know, a very straightforward notion of yeah. what the, 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 the lyric is about. It's, 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 it's very direct. Uh, and it goes back to about May 1971. So it's, he's had it knocking around for a while. He's had it knocking around for a while. Um, this this was written following uh, Mick Jagger's wedding, apparently. Um, <laughs> so Ringo and Paul were amongst the people that were flown out to uh, to, to Mick's wedding um, in the south of France. And uh, after the, the, the wedding was over, uh, Paul flies home. Ringo charters a yacht and is joined by uh, George and Maureen and Scylla Black. And they go for a little <laughs> surprise, little, surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. They go for a little sail round uh, the south of France and um, write this wonderful song. Yeah, and it's you know there's still um, uh, yeah there's still you know I said good vibes between the whole dynamic of um, uh, Ringo and his wife and George and his wife and none of that madness has kicked in yet. Uh, and yeah, the whole Jagger. Um, Mick Jagger, Bianca Jagger wedding was just a total yeah. crazy. Like they all didn't they? They didn't know they bundled all these people on a private jet, like Ringo they, and yeah. Paul and yeah. Ronnie Wood, who even wasn't even in the Stones at the time. They just yeah. took yeah. them off to the south of France, and then they didn't know the legalities of how to get married, and it was just a total farce in a way. Yeah, my favorite comment is from David David Hepworth. Uh, oh, yeah. who said the the Jagger wedding was the shabbiest free for all in the history of both rock and marriage and skin crawlingly <laughs> embarrassing for all the key participants. I mean, it doesn't hold back there, but um, if you've seen some of the, the, the footage of that, yes, uh, yeah, have. you know, uh, Jagger hadn't realized that the, the wedding had to be open to the public under French law. So suddenly there's a, there's a scrum of, of uh, journalists and photographers. Um, Bianca is, uh, you know, spilling out of her dress as the <laughs> photographers are taking photographs. Um, uh, suddenly they realize they have to make a declaration of community property before the wedding. And uh, Bianca, not too happy that there isn't much community property that they both own. <laughs> yes. um, the uh, There were three best men, or at least three people laying claim to being the best man at the wedding. There was Bobby Keys, Keith Richards, French <laughs> film director, Roger Vadim. I mean, it was just a complete shambles yeah uh, a complete shambles uh ringo probably glad to get onto a boat with uh george and maureen and before the uh, richard perry recording there was apparently a a late 72 recording which george produced this is something i only heard of recently and i've never heard it if anybody out there has a copy uh, has we, we a don't want to hear it that'd be illegal <laughs> that would be illegal but but you know but but do do get in touch and describe it to us uh <laughs> yes uh, via Twitter or Facebook. And, uh, you know, you listen to Photograph and it's great to hear, you know, George coming in on harmony. Like, it's 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 that really distinctive Beatle harmony when you realise what's happening. Like, when you hear John in the background of I'm the Greatest and you hear George in the background of Photograph, you know, it's a thing, all right. It is. I mean, there's a lot of focus put on the fact, uh, you know, how well John and Paul sing together, but but George and Ringo have that that a sensational yeah. blend and what the other thing i like about this is the uh, this song is the guitar work yes. the arrangement the the sort of the, what seems to be 12 string guitar it's it's just a beautifully arranged uh track yes. how much of how much of that is down to george and how much of that is down to richard perry i don't know that's well, the other why person I wouldn't... you have in the room is jack nietzsche who's uh yes. doing the orchestra and chorus doing the, doing the string yeah and he's he's good at doing that kind of thing yeah. Um, and there was a promo filmed for this at Tittenhurst Park as well. And that went on to, out onto Top of the Pops. That's knocking around on the on the Internet. Yes. Um, um, this is this is I mean, I, I, I sort of in passing said, you know, this is the best solo Beatles single. I mean, I, I, I genuinely believe it's it's certainly up there. Uh, it's a fantastic song. Well, it's very, it, you know, it's, it's very, you know, um, it's very sweet, and it's it 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 really summons up its its tone very well of looking back and you know thinking about what it means, yeah. and you know you kind of think about you know what Ringo 
uh, is like or the kind of emotions Ringo generates. And he does generate, if you think of his kind of morose, sympathetic, kind of his walk along the towpath in a hard day's yep. night, that kind of thing that he, he he manages to make us feel for him. This is kind of the musical equivalent of of that. Yes, uh, it, it's. I suppose it sort of sums Ringo's character up in one song. Yeah, and it, it kind of takes another turn, you know, in November two thousand and two when he he comes on at the concert for George and sings it. That's 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 a that's a, a lump in the throat. It that that is a lump in the throat moment. Um, you know what strikes me about Ringo's performance uh, is he sings two songs. He sings photograph and he sings honey don't. Mm. Everybody else sings a George Harrison song. Yeah. But but Ringo is sort of sufficiently comfortable in his relationship with George that, that you know, he doesn't have to do that. He does a, a rockabilly song because George loved rockabilly. And then he sings this, which is a co-write. Yes. And, you know, he's it, this clip is available on, on YouTube, but he's performing this under a giant photograph of George Harrison taken around 1965, 1966. Mm-hmm. And he, he, he references the fact that this song has taken on different different meaning uh any chance you were at that gig Stephen? um no you met yes i'd forgotten <laughs> i'd forgotten i'd forgotten that i was uh, I, I was at that gig but obviously when you're at that gig and um you know i was Ring- at that gig i know you were at that gig yeah. you, you've mentioned that once or twice but but ringo comes out did, can i ask like did you have a sense that oh he's going to play photograph or you or did you have any no. idea of what anyone was going to play on that night no, I mean, I genuinely had no idea. And uh, it, 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 Ringo coming out, that was an absolute high point. And yeah. the, the, the opening sort of chords of photograph, I mean, it was an incredibly emotional yeah. uh, experience. Um, just the, the fact that Ringo was on the stage and then to be doing that song. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And as you say, you, you realized, you, as soon as he started to play it, you realized that this was going to be this was going to take on, as you say, a different a different meaning. Absolutely. Um, so great song, Photograph. Track four on side one is Sunshine Life for Me, open bracket, Sail Away Raymond, close bracket, George Harrison written on his own. And yep. um, it's an interesting song, uh, written apparently, uh, I didn't know this until you told me, written uh, in Ireland. Yes. And uh, you say, you know, you say it was written by George, but uh, Donovan was there. All right. And, and it's a wonder he's not trying to FaceTime us well, right now to tell us his role in writing well, that song. You know, I mean, I think Donovan, <laughs> Donovan, Donovan, you know, big influence on the Beatles, helped them write a lot of things. You can tell. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was in, uh, written in County Kildare. Yes. Uh, it, and uh, the timing was the Easter weekend in April 1971. And George says he wrote it like an old Irish folk song. I'm I'm not sure I get the old Irish folk song. It, it sounds more like that pirate song that he sings in Rutland Weekend. <laughs> yeah, to me. Yes. It's got that kind of hey ho yeah. and a nanny nanny kind of thing. Yeah, to it. yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the 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 background. I mean, I, I again the first time I heard this this album, I just thought, oh, it's an interesting kind of twangy country song. And who is Raymond? Um, but the Raymond was apparently a lawyer. Yeah. Let's hear it. Let's hear it for the lawyers. Hey. Uh, um, hired by so he was he was one of the, he was their lawyer. He was the uh, Klein's lawyer Alan. for the three Beatles. Well, wasn't he? He was, yep, yep, yep. That's it. And in March of seventy one uh, was when the High Court ruled that you know uh, they were going to appoint a a, a receiver. Um, so George very much had this on his mind, and Patty Boyd has said this is this is what was going through his mind at the time that he was very upset. Uh, about the the sort of the rowing and the the, the ill feeling, um, and it's the idea to sail away, Raymond. You yeah. Know, uh, if if we could get rid of the lawyers, the world would be a better place. <laughs> well, he writes <laughs> he writes that song as you say, Easter seventy one and March seventy one is when that court case kind of ends. Well, yeah. You know, the first round of it ends in Paul's favour, saying the Beatles should go into receivership. And you know, it's interesting. You kind of look at the. You, you you pick up a copy of Ringo and you look at the back and you say, oh, I wonder who's playing on that. And it's Robbie Robertson, Levon Helm, Rick Danko, Garth Hudson. It's four out of the five members of the band. Um, yeah. Richard Manuel is, is is elsewhere. And, you know, again, you're like, what what a stellar lineup, you know? And the, the band are in Los Angeles at the time recording Moondog Matinee, which is another kind of rock and roll throwback kind it, of call. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of covers album and... Um, this was taken very much at the time, you know, that the band were running a bit dry on the songwriting front, running out of uh, 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 inspiration. 
Yeah. Um, and, and you can see that, you know, songs like Rag, Mama, Rag, I ha- clearly have an influence um, on, on the style of this song and uh, just the general feel of, of the song. Um, the other person who's on the song is a guitar player called uh, David Bromberg. Oh, yeah. Who uh, worked with Bob Dylan back in the uh, sort of New Morning era. Uh, and he and George, uh, around that time, wrote a song called The Hold Up. Okay. Uh, which again, it's not a song I had ever heard. Um, George, I don't think ever recorded it, but uh, you can check that out on Spotify and YouTube. It's interesting, you know. You, you think of "Sunshine Life" for me, and you know, you might think, okay, it's just a, it's, a, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not all things must pass. But then you kind of t- tear into the lyrics a little bit, and it really is. Again, it's almost like George, George's motto, where he sings, "It's a sunshine life for me. If I could get away from this cloud over me, it seems to follow me around." That's a real George motto almost that he's trying to constantly get to some kind of point of peace but he can't get away from the things that drag him down he's he's a great one for a cloud slash rain metaphor yes well there's nothing wrong with weather metaphors in in music that's that's this week's uh jeff lynn mention anyway (laughs) So many songs about weather. I feel I just (laughs) set that up. I just walked straight into that. Um, And the other thing I noticed on this, maybe you don't know anything about this, is that the song is published by the Material World Charitable Foundation, which George had set up in 73. Yes, yes. So, so it's a charity is, uh, song, isn't it, or something? It's, well, uh, no, what, what he did was uh, he set up a, a, a charity to uh, uh, direct some of the songwriting royalties uh, to good causes. Because that's the kind of guy he was. He's a he's a he's a good man. He is uh, a good. Man. He is a good man. A good man. Um, okay, uh, so that leads us then to the end of side one, which is your sixteen, which is the track we've already talked about before, the yeah. the, the Nielsen rock and roll rave up, and that's the end of side one. Very tidy side one, all killer, no filler. I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you then flip over to the B side. First track is "Oh My Mine." Now this ended up being the third single. Um, I think this is probably my least favorite bit of the album, to be honest. Yeah, it's not a song. It's not a song that I like particularly, but it was a top five hit. Yeah, uh, in 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 the US. Um, and again, the the if you look if you look at the roster of talent that that Ringo was able to sort of draw, you know, we had the band, virtually all of the band on 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 the previous track. This, the backing vocals here are Mary Clayton, uh, he's worked with the Stones, and Martha Reeves, mm. not not the Vandalas, but Martha Reeves. So, yeah. you know, if you're Ringo, you can presumably just pick up the phone, get these people to turn up in the studio. And Billy Preston is on piano and organ. Yeah, um, but I, I agree with you. I, don't, I, I think this is actually one of the weaker tracks, but... What do I know? Top five hit. Yeah. Well, then the second track on side two, I think is kind of maybe the little hidden gem of the album, which is Step Lightly. Mm. Uh, And this is the only sole Ringo Starr writing credit on the album. So it's a pure Ringo original. And it is a it is a, a little gem, you know, and Ringo's tap dancing on it as well. It is. Yeah. So he he uh, supposedly at the end of a a session in London, uh, he he was slightly the worse for wear. Sent his chauffeur out to buy some tap shoes, and uh, just decided, yeah, what, what this needs is a tap solo. <laughs> but it's 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 very funny. It's very it's very entertaining. And and Ringo obviously likes it. He uh, re-recorded the song on Ringo Twenty Twelve. Right. Um, and it's interesting, this song and a couple of other songs, but this song in particular features Tom Scott arranging the clarinets. And Tom Scott's a, a fascinating guy. He's got this Zelig-like appearance where he pops yeah. up in lots of rock and roll history. So he plays the solo on Listen to What the Man Said. Uh, he pops up on things like Black Cow by uh, Steely Dan, Rapture by uh, Blondie. He yep. comes up on one of Robbie Williams' standards albums. He was in the Blues Brothers band. He's he's uh, a really interesting fellow. Yeah, and at, at this time, he is just about to start working with Joni Mitchell. Yeah. So the Court and Spark album and then uh, Tom Scott and the LA Express. Yes. Uh head off with Joni Mitchell to do uh, a tour. Uh, I think the, the live album is called Miles of Isles. And um, when they are in London, yeah. George George goes along to the Joni Mitchell concert and then invites everybody back to his house. And they form the nucleus of the band that recorded Dark Horse. Interesting. And the other thing that, you know, uh, worth mentioning about Tom Scott was that he was the band leader on the Chevy Chase show. Now, this is a bit of a, have you ever seen any clips of the Chevy Chase show? 
Clearly not. Clearly not. In 1993, no. there was one of these battle of late night televisions in the US and Chevy Chase was given a talk show on the Fox network that lasted about six weeks. It went up against Dave Letterman's new late show. And it is one of the biggest catastrophes uh, on television. Uh, you can dial it up on YouTube. Try and see how far you can get into the first episode without dying of a, just an absolute cringeworthy. You're, you're watching it through your fingers. It is catastrophically bad television. But Tom Scott was the band leader on that show. Who, 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 who decided it would be a good idea to give Chevy Chase a... There was a lot of cocaine uh, in those <laughs> well, days. Well, you know, he, he kind of... I think people had thought, well, he'd, he'd been on Saturday Night Live back in the day and he told jokes and sat at a desk. But but I, I swear to God, the Chevy Chase show, uh, episode one is Goldie Hawn, and it's they decide at one point to just start dancing. And uh, one of my favourite bits of the show is he comes out to the audience and like all these shows, the audience are all clapping and everything else. And the set is all LA and there's a basketball net and somebody throws him a basketball and he throws it at the basketball net and misses. And he keeps throwing the basketball into the net and keeps missing. And this is riveting television. It's, uh, it's, it's, oh, it's just, it's just awful. But the Chevy Chase show from 1993, look that up on T- on, on YouTube if you want to uh, entertain yourself. Or don't. Or don't. <laughs> so that leads us to the next song, the third track on side two. Uh, some might say it's the best song on the album. It's the track Six O'Clock, which is Paul's contribution. So it seems that Richard and Richard Perry and Ringo decamp at the end of March to the UK. And uh, Ringo attends uh, the premiere of uh, a movie that he's starring in called That'll Be the Day in London on the 12th of April. And Paul and Linda are there. Uh, And then four days later, um, Ringo is recording this song in the Apple studio with Paul and Linda and Richard behind the desk. Yeah. And the context for this is interesting because um, it's around this time, 31st of March, uh, so just as literally as Ringo is touching down in 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 the UK, Alan Klein's management contract expires with uh, John George and Ringo and is not renewed. Yes. Um, so what what what's sort of significant is that McCartney has gone on record earlier in the year to say, oh, you know, we could record together again if Alan Klein isn't is out of the picture, and suddenly Alan Klein is out of the picture. Yes. And a couple of days later, John is giving an interview in which he says, let's just say it's possible that Paul's suspicions were right. <laughs> so so suddenly there, there is again added impetus to this. Another obstacle is out of the way. Um, we've had three Beatles recording in LA. Now two Beatles are recording in, in London. So that's yeah. the, the context for the sort of feeding frenzy that's going on around. They're going to reform. They're going to reform. But that's a reasonably understandably an understandable thing that you could you, you could you, you could take from all of that because you think you know if you look at as you say march and april the end of march alan klein is legally officially out of the picture um, yeah. george ringo and john are in no place to bring him back or to keep him involved at all and you know you can say well look yes we've had this george ringo john session klein is gone can we get paul yes we've got paul Two and two could easily make four in a in a you know when you're looking at that from the outside. Ab- absolutely, and again, the context of this is we've just had the release of uh, the red album and the blue album, the yeah. compilations. So they are sort of pr- making their way to the top of the charts. They are the Be- the Beatles are back in the charts. Um, they're very visible. Uh, the, the the there's a there's a growing interest again in the band. Um, and yeah, this this is probably uh, you know the stars are sort of aligning at this point. And you kind of think that you know if anyone you know it had been very definitely you know in the media and in you know in between themselves it had been Paul versus the other three. And you look at seventy yep. seventy one seventy two, you know George is recording with John. Uh, you know he's in the Imagine film. You know Ringo is recording on John's singles. You know George and Ringo, as we said, have done a ton of work together. So there's there's a whole there is a John Ringo George. George Axis that's been going on 70 to 72 and Paul has been totally a man apart and he's been you know getting some bad criticism in the press he's trying to plow his own furrow you know it's, it's interesting you look at this album and as you say it features kind of the creme de la creme of LA session ears but you know that's not the world that Paul is moving in at the start of the 70s he's making records in a very very different way and, you know, it's it's a big deal that this is kind of the first time you can draw a line between John Lennon and Paul McCartney in an artistic yes. setting. Yes. I mean, this is this is really Paul entering back into that uh, 
circle to, yeah. to, to an extent. The, w- one of the fascinating things is that consistently later in his career, when Paul ha- has, has a tour to promote or a product to sell, he would tap into the Beatle reunion rumor and he would say, oh, well, you know, we might get together again or we might do something. And this is, this is something that George in particular was always um, sort of quite dismissive of and, and uh, saying, you know, if you want to see the Beatles, go and see Wings. So Paul, but what happens here is later in the year in May, whenever Paul is, is pushing his tour and he's, he's really driving to get Wings established, mm. you know, they, they've had a pretty shaky start. They've got Red Road Speedway. They're just about to do Band on the Run. He's he's actually quite dismissive of what has happened in in terms of the recording, and he's saying, "Oh well, I would I would have done it for any friend." Yeah. So he almost almost is sort of downplaying this to the level of, "Well, you know, if anybody had phoned me up, you know, like if Mick had phoned me up, or I, I, yeah, I'm happy but, but to go he, and play." But he also says when he's doing the the, the James Paul McCartney TV special, he's, he gives an interview and he says, "Well, there's no real reason why we shouldn't get together again once you know Alan Klein is gone." Like he's he's not totally locking that down. Yeah, it's 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 I, I I'm interested to know what happened between him saying that, mm. which which was sort of in March or earlier in the year when they're they're doing that filming, and then a month afterwards or two months afterwards when he's he's promoting the tour, it's it's sort of being downplayed again, and he's clearly he's clearly I think at that stage wings have not established themselves on a sound footing and he, yeah. he seems to be wanting to shift the focus back to well this is what i'm doing now and this is my band but it is very much so this this recording session in april of six o'clock this is very much a reaction to the you know i'm the greatest you know the the john george and ringo session because ringo yeah. apparently calls paul up and says some version of hey you don't want to be left out of this do you and yeah. paul says okay you know let's let's do it so he's he's not um you know, it, it, it would have been totally imaginable for him to say, no, listen, you just keep doing your own thing. I've got my own thing going on. But he does roll up his sleeves and he he uh, he, he does this song. Um, do you like Six O'Clock? It's okay. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> it's not a highlight of the album. It's I, I, I think for me, part of the problem is it's quite dated in, in, in the keyboard, the sort of synth. Yeah sound is 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 quite dated um i think I do, it certainly do, sits apart from the rest of the album it doesn't it, it sounds yeah. of a different thing uh yes i mean i think i think the other songs on the album have a sort of a general as you say that 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 mood that sort of nostalgic uh, this this doesn't this is this is sort of jarringly modern uh mm, yeah. with with the keyboard side it's that said it's it's very much you know you've got the paul and linda vocal mix yeah. there uh particularly there's a there's a short version on the album and then there's a slightly longer extended version which is just wings yes well it does have a sort of you know something we talk about a lot is the 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 McGear album but it has a certain kind of McGear vibe it's just this yeah. early 70s pop mccartney linda singing with them um it, it as you say you know th- there's this rock and roll feel to the rest of the album whereas this does feel like what mccartney was doing contemporaneously yeah. and it's recorded yeah. In the UK, it's uh, even though it's still produced by Richard Perry, but you look at the the settings or the the the, the credits on the back, and it's like okay, Paul's playing piano, Paul's playing the synthesizer. Oddly enough, Klaus Foreman is still on bass. <laughs> that, mm. You would have thought there was a bass player in the room, um, but it's got those Linda vocals, which are a very you know solo Beatle sound, and yeah. uh, you know the the this it's it's also and I. I appreciate what you're saying about the synthesizer sounds of its time, but it's still got that classic kind of McCartney organization and structure where there's a synth and there's a string section and there's some flutes and there's some vocals and there's a melody line on top. It's, it's, it is a it's, Paul jam. It's a pop song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas I think the others, whether it's rock or rock and roll, the other, the other songs on the album are, are sort of rock and roll songs. This is, this is very clearly a pop song. It's, it, you, again, as you say, it's got all of the hallmarks of of a Paul McCartney, not even a Paul McCartney song, but a Paul McCartney production. I mean, yeah. if Richard Perry hadn't been there, I don't think this would have sounded very much different. Yeah, and as you say, there is a there is a the version on the album is about four minutes. There is a longer version that's about five and a half minutes, where it's just got one of those kind of McCartney uh, improv codas at the end, where you can just hear him kind of vamping and and singing the the the. Uh, riffs over again on the, yeah. on the end of it um it gets it gets kind of it does kind of get pointed out in in certain reviews of the album that some say it has you know uh it doesn't really have the collaborative feeling of the the other parts of the album in terms of collaborating with Ringo no uh it has a certain slight 
charm is how somebody put it. But my favorite, my favorite comment on this is someone called Alan Betrock. I'm sure that's not a real name um, of Phonograph Record, who wrote Paul McCartney six o'clock would have been a perfect chart topper for himself and Wings, possibly rivaling yesterday in worldwide stature. I don't and, think and, so. I think you're, he's on his own there. I think. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I'll 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 I'll, I'll wave a flag for McCartney. I don't think it's that good, but it is. No. It is one of those early seventies McCartney pop nuggets. If uh, yeah. if you're into that kind of thing, um, then next track, second last track on the album is "Devil Woman," and unfortunately, this is not the Cliff Richard song from 1976. That would I I would love to hear Ringo. <laughs> to to devil woman. that is a yeah. great song cliff richard it is a great it is a great song it is a great song um great song. and again this is this is this is fun I, it's maybe a little bit slight but it's uh you know it's yeah, just a it's rocker with it, yeah kind of clunky ringo lyrics on top little little bit raunchy uh lyrics for yeah. ringo but uh you know and it does mention it does have a beatles illusion in it it mentions sexy sadie in the lyric so does it? Uh, it does, yeah. Hold on. Do you want me to get out my, my lyric sheet in front of me and, and read it out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the lyric is, um, where is it? every time I see you in the neighborhood, I say you're the kind of woman that makes me feel good. I want to beat you up and then I want to be kind. And one of these days I'm going to make you mine. Sexy Sadie, you look like the devil to me. Devil woman, that's not the way it should be. So, uh, you'd, um, you'd never get away with that lyric today. Oh, uh, Jesus. It's just, well, that's, that, uh, I, that's, I wish, I, I wish, I, hadn't, I wish I'd, I hadn't started when I was in the middle of reading that. Do you want, do you want, do you want to go back and read <laughs> something else? Um, no, 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 let's leave it be. The, the, well, again, uh, Sexy Sadie was around a lot because she pops up on a George Harrison song on Dark Horse. Which one? Remind me now. Um, the rest is simply shady. Uh, but oh. said, you, may, you may think of Sexy Sadie, let her in through your front door. Ah, well, there again, you know, it's just pressing the kind of the nostalgia, hey, remember the Beatles kind of buttons, you know, where people like you and me will go, hey, he mentioned the Beatles. That's yeah, my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we get to the end of the, the record, track five, side two. This record is only 37 minutes long. It's 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 shorter than this podcast. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, the last track on the album is You and Me, open brackets, babe, close brackets, uh, written by Harrison and good old Mal Evans. I love this song. Yeah, I think I think this is a great song, and uh, I, I I like the the idea that Mal uh, was getting some royalties. Uh, yes, here. So Matt, Mal Evans is is you know just a quick recap. He's the uh, uh, was effectively one of their road managers in the early sixties. He was involved in Apple. Um, he's now working. He he discovered Badfinger, etc. So he's he's been kind of part of their inner circle for a long time. Um, so he and he and Harrison are sharing a house in LA. Uh, he had the lyric. He asked Harrison, "Could he do something with it?" And lo and behold, he gets a, a, a writing credit on one of the biggest albums of the year. Yeah, and it's great. It's just another member of the old gang being pulled into the the flow of this project. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's there's a lot to like about this. George's guitar is so sweet on it. It's so nice, and he's not doing his '70s slide. He's playing just a really yeah. lovely melodic bit of guitar soloing all over it it's great and again Nicky Hopkins is still on piano it's it's Ringo on drums and it's not Ringo and Jim Keltner I'm always odd that there's a lot of songs that are credited to Ringo and Jim Keltner on drums yeah is that really just Jim Keltner I don't know is it, yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is just Ringo on drums uh Klaus on bass Nicky Hopkins uh, uh Tom Scott and Jack Nietzsche again arranging the 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 the, the, the backing to it and uh, yeah it's a it's an infectious kind of uh, uh fun it's... song yeah, it's a gorgeous song, and um, you know you you were saying back when we were talking about "I'm the Greatest" and the allusion to the the the, the Beatles, and uh, you 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 have a crowd noise in the background there, and again you've got this this is sort of completes the circle. This is him doing a sign off, and at the end of this, he he actually sings about uh, this being a record. You know, yes, he sings, there's this, this spoken I'm, word bit. Yeah. yeah, and he's like, I'm here on this little bit of plastic that's spinning round and round, and I'd like to say thank you to everybody. And he very carefully, you know, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, he he lists uh, everybody, and and suddenly the Beatles are all together again. Uh, yes, it really drives the point home about what this project is. Mm. And, you know, even that bit where he kind of refers to himself in the third person, your friend and mine, Ringo Starr, that's kind of how he yeah. signs off. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, something that, you know, you and me talk a bit about is that, you know, Ringo, he's really a fantastic musician and drummer, but unfortunately he sidles himself up to being more of this kind of entertainer, you know, this guy who gets up to sing a song type thing. Yeah. And I think this is the best capturing of this notion of 
Ringo as a friend, as an entertainer, as being all things to all people, you know, th- that kind of sign off where he's talking to us all. That's that's, again, just essence of him. It is. It's it's it's. And uh, as I say, it sort of completes the concept of the album. Yeah. You really do. You do really feel that you you're sort of, you know, he's inviting you in. He's 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 sort of making fun of himself. He's not taking anything too seriously. And then there's this very sort of warm uh, um, sort of send off. Yeah. Um, and so that's the last track on the album. And, you know, there's some, uh, you know, overdubs and arrangements and things that come on. We should also mention that, you know, Paul adds some overdubs to your 16 as well. He plays the mouth sax solo. Um, yeah, there's there's a bit of a bit of dispute as to exactly what he's doing there. Is he playing a kazoo or is he just a comb and paper or is he just sort of doing a Lady Madonna and, kind of and job doing a Lady it. Madonna kind of thing on it. But uh, yeah. But yeah, this notion that the album represents, you know, if it is a concept album that it represents kind of a a showcase or a presentation of Ringo, then you can say that by looking at the cover, that really drives that notion home. So the the cover art and and, and the booklet that came with the original copies, it, that all fits in with all of this, doesn't it? It is, it is. I mean, it's an incredibly lavish uh, um, uh, cover and booklet. And, you know, you're very detailed, hand-painted uh, cover, which features, a, a sort of, again, it's a little bit of a nod to Sergeant Pepper where you've got a crowd... Uh, scene and they say if you look you've got Paul and Linda and uh, George and John and Yoko are all in the crowd yeah um, the band are there the band are there you, yeah. you you've got a booklet um, where Klaus Vorman has handwritten the lyrics out and done a little sort of lithograph um, for to illustrate every single song so this is this is a, a, an incredibly lavish yeah I've um, got I've got package. my copy in front of me right now which Stephen you'll recall I bought for the princely sum of one pound uh, in yes. Belfast a number of years ago definitely definitely worth a pound definitely worth a pound an immaculate condition album where um, uh, the man in the record store was like oh I don't know I think it's a pound um, but it's it's, it's this gateful sleeve beautifully uh, you know, these beautiful kind of stars all throughout the gatefold sleeve. And then this very detailed 12 inch booklet attached to the gatefold sleeve where uh, Stephen says there, there's these Klaus Warman drawings, one for each track um, in and around all the specs for the album itself. It's a really, um, it's a really lovely package, but it, it does add, as I said, to the, the concept of it, that this is a show, this is Ringo presenting himself. This is a, you know, a glorified version of himself. And I, I, I think I'm right in saying, is there a reference on the back to the Jim Keltner fan club? There is. There's a reference. If you go inside the, the that lovely uh, booklet, it says at the bottom, yeah, the Jim Keltner fan club uh, send a stamped undressed envelope to 1750 North Vine Street, Hollywood, California, which I think is the Capitol building. And it, was, uh, no, uh, uh, it was Jim Keltner's address. Oh, was it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, whoops! I, whoops. Um, uh, yeah, because I remember uh, I, there was a, there was an interview with Jim Keltner where he says, "Yes, it was hilarious, except they actually used my address, and um, <laughs> I was inundated with uh, uh, you, you know letters and things." But that that was a bit of a, a, a dig at Paul um, using that because he had uh, Paul had put on the back of a Wings album. All right. Um, the the Wings fan club send a stamped addressed envelope to. And gave the address, so Ringo, <laughs> Ringo sort of was sending that up, and I think it's on Living in the Material World. George does the same oh, yeah, by saying, right. he says, "Send a stamped undressed elephant to," <laughs> and, and gives an address. So you know, it is all, it is, good, all, all good fun, all good larks, and it's it's a good. And then written across the top, there's the seemingly portentous Latin phrase written around an apple, apple, uh, "Dui yeah. en mon day," which is actually pigeon latin slash french for do it on monday which is a nielsenism it is and, more nielsen uh, more nielsen and he he used that as a uh, as the title of an album the next yes year or a couple of he years did now. yeah he did the original title of the reason he used that as a title was that uh, uh, that Nielsen album was originally supposed to be called God's Greatest Hits and the label balked ah. at the last minute. <laughs> but I think God's Greatest Hits is a fantastic album title. I hope somebody's used it in the meantime. Um, when, you're, when your first album comes out. That's when my, yeah, when I, when I drop my surprise r- r- record. And then, then the final bit of design is that, that record label, because uh, it's not a classic Apple record label. No. No. Uh, do you want to describe it, or should we just let people <laughs> find out? It's 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 uh, it's it's you know it's yeah it's purel. It, it's well, basically the, the the little record label in the middle of the twelve inch record is um, uh, a star shape of Ringo, and he's kind of it's his head popping out from under a silk sheet in, in a star formation. And when you put the record on a spindle, 
in we your see record where player. We, 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 we okay. see where you're going with okay. this. We see where the, you're going. The with spindle this. sticks out. Do you know what I'm trying to point out? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's what, so that's one last joke for all of us. Um, right. So so this album comes out and it's preceded in September '73 by the photograph single. Um, yeah. The album comes out on November the third. At the end of November, photograph is number one. So. This is a hit hit album, you know, and and you look this at the big, yeah, yeah. You look at the hits of nineteen seventy three. So number one in the in the US um, in nineteen seventy three. Uh, earlier in the year, you've already had uh, number ones from uh, George and Paul. So uh, Paul's had My Love at number one in June. He's knocked off the number one spot by George saying, Give me love, give me peace on earth. And now here in November 73, November 24th for one week, uh, you get Ringo Starr at number one with Photograph and the album climbs up into the US top 10 as well. So it's a big smash hit record. Uh, there's no yeah, denying that. No, and three three singles. I think this is, the, this is the record and the singles that prompted Lennon to, to uh, say to Ringo, you know, any chance you could write me a hit. Um, <laughs> So, you know, he was he was at this point, he's he's outselling John Lennon. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the a photograph uh, is the first single. Uh, Your 16 comes out as the second single in December. That hits number one for a week at the end of January 74. And then Oh My My comes out in February 74. And that hits the top 10 as well. So yeah, two number ones and a top 10 hit, uh, you know, he can and it do, sets he, 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 Yeah, he can do no wrong. I mean, 1973, I think, is really the absolute peak Ringo. Uh, but a bit like, the, you know, the I'm the greatest session, you know, where you think, oh, this is the start of something new and it actually turns out to be the end of something. Mm. Is the Ringo album also the end of something? I mean, it's, 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 it never gets as good again, really, does it? I, I, I think that's, that's part, part, part of the problem. Yeah. Um, and it, it hasn't, its reputation hasn't aged well. Um, you know, to to be to have been a number one album and had those singles, it's it's almost part of that pre last waltz. You yeah. know, where you've got all of these superstars. You could just get, um, you know, if you want to get Martha Reeves in, you get Martha Reeves in. If you want Mark Bolan, you get Mark Bolan. And it's there, there's something about that whole early 70s LA scene which yeah. is just about to be swept away um so so it's a high point of that and it's also a high point as you say you're you're not going to get this level of collaboration across all four Beatles um again Ringo's not going to have um commercial success on the, on this scale yeah again um you know, when you've reached the top, there's only one way to go. Well, you could argue, yeah, and you could, you could, you could, you know, if you're being a bit cruel, you could say, well, you know, he delivers this great album, and I still enjoy it. I think it's great fun, but you kind of think, well, you know, this might be all the Ringo I need. I, I'm like, there's, mm. there's, 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 there isn't really anything else that he can do. This is the best version of that thing he does. Is this album? I think so. I think that's right. I mean, if 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 you only had to buy one album, one yeah. Ringo album, this this would be it. But you know, it's a great album. Oh, it is a great album. Now, there's there's one or two things you could say that you know perhaps would have helped. Obviously, Ringo didn't tour. You know, so in terms of promoting the album, he's got these three hit singles, but it was never really an option that there was going to be a a Ringo Starr world tour or or anything of that kind. He doesn't tour until the end of the. 80s when the All Star Band comes into play, um, yeah. so that kind of leaves him adrift in terms of trying to be creative or, 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 or trying to keep a momentum going. You could say, I think so. I, 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 you know, he he sort of tries to replicate the formula on the next album, which is Goodnight Vienna. Yeah, and there's an there's there's it's a it's a good album. Um, but there's an increasing sort of diminishing return as 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 as, as we go on. There there it's. You know, he he had appeared at Bangladesh, so he he'd done his little solo spot there. Um, there is a very strong rumor circulating in early '74 that he's going to tour with uh, George. All oh, right, that there's going to be that 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 dark horse tour of America is going to be a joint um, George and Ringo tour. Around this time, George and Ringo were looking at buying Apple. Oh. Um, at sort of buying the other two out and thinking, well, this would be a good vehicle. So it's it's also probably the height of of their relationship yeah um sort of uh, artistic collaboration um but yes this is it's it's the it's 
the absolute peak of something, but I, I think you're right. It's also the start of uh, the end of something as well. But there's also, there's probably one other thing, and we've talked about this uh, before, which is the notion that, okay, the album isn't out of print, but there probably is a little bit of work that needs to be done on Ringo's back catalogue, you know, that, that, that there's a, a market there for some kind of, you know, Ringo Starr, the Apple albums, where you take Boku of Blue, Sentimental Journey, Ringo, and Goodnight Vienna, and a fifth CD of, you know, bonus tracks or some sessions yeah. and all the rest package that up and say look this is a, a this is a nice little body of work it's reflective of the time this was what the the drummer in the beatles did next yes i mean i think so i mean you know we, we have a we have a reissue of the ringo album has come out i think uh goodnight vienna came out as well and um but yes i you know an apple ringo the apple year is a box set i'd buy that well, yeah, but you'd, you'd buy anything, wouldn't you? No, <laughs> that, that's pretty much. True. <laughs> All right. Well, look, that is the Ringo album, a little time capsule from uh, November 1973 from Ringo Starr. Um, like many of the things we do here, hopefully this will send you back to the record and give a listen to it with fresh ears. It, it, it is a little bottle of joy um, and it's a super album and maybe worthy of a little bit more love and attention but um, uh, you know maybe that's all the Ringo you need um, so that's it from this time around uh, we are available in all the usual places we are on Twitter at Beatles Pod uh, there's the Facebook group which uh, Stephen looks after you can uh, go along there um, if you enjoy the show uh, make sure you're subscribed um, wherever you listen to your podcasts please uh, leave us a nice review for now my name's Jason Carty my name's Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real. Nothing Is Real is powered by ACAST. Mm-hmm.